Daniel Giordano's show I met because we were doing an art fair in New York um, called Nada. And I came across his work and why I was drawn to his work specifically was that I thought for a sculptor he was making work that was oddly original, which is not something that you expect an artist to be um, because it's 2019 and like original is a very um, heavy burden to expect to have an artist bear. Um, but he was doing very strange things like deep frying motorcycles <laughs> and so on. And so I thought this is really interesting work. It's, it's really original. Um, I've never seen anything like it before. And, and I, I look at a lot of art. And so it felt very contemporary in a way. And it felt very American speaks to the current American moment. So like we are now doing the show, I think very timely, but it took actually th three years from when we first met to have the series of conversations over the phone to do studio visits and Skype calls and text um, picture exchanges and so on to like finally get to this moment where there's two bodies of work that we're presenting in an exhibition. Yeah, it's been three years since that NADA and we've, I've visited Daniel Newberg in Yeah, you visited New me York. in New York. Yeah. I brought um, work down. Yeah, so I, I visited his studio, I've seen the factory where his studio is located and sort of understand how these materials come about from that place of making. I've seen how he's lived, uh, which also explains how the materials in this show have come together and like his, his approach as a sculptor. Um, I think it's very similar to this approach as a, as a living person. So, <laughs> so um, it, it makes sense to me. Um, it was good and then we've had a series of discussions like because his work sort of evolved quite a bit actually since I first came across it. And I, I think for me like the, the biggest thing to figure out was like what the work was about because Daniel operates very similarly to a lot of other artists which is that they don't necessarily want to like explain why they make the work that they make um, and you can't really get that information unless you figure it out for yourself um, and his work is not easy um, which which immediately pinged to me as like contemporary because I couldn't understand it right away there was no frame of reference I wasn't seeing like it wasn't reminding me of another artist who worked in a very similar way so it made me actually want to pay attention because I wasn't getting any easy reference points so I couldn't figure out the work so I had to like, he made me kind of work. He didn't explain it. Um, and I would like say dumb things. Like, I think the work makes me feel like this. And he'd be like, yeah, well, I don't know. Like, I don't think that that's really quite right. <laughs> and and I, I get nothing but discouragement from him that like, I'm not quite, <laughs> quite gotten it, you know? So um, it took some time. It was a process for me to understand it. But it's, I think that that's really, really important. And yeah. Well, making this body of work for the show, you know, it put me, it, it gave me a challenge to explore materials in a certain way and working through these masks in particular, I realized that a lot of the work that I'm doing, it's weaving these materials to make a sort of poetics, a, a poetic, you know, uh, conversation. Um, so there's certain things that really stand out to me and make sense, like urinal cakes and cattails, they go perfectly together. Or licorice and ticks. Um, <laughs> Can you explain how those things go together? Is that like... Uh, so the urinal cake and, and uh, um, cattails, I'm thinking a lot, of my, a lot about my brother. And uh, I have this sort of warped uh, fantasy of him where I sort of keep him in this basement and force him to write. And it comes out literally through him writing, you know, and contributing to the shows. Um, the writing for this, this show is Anthony's. Right. Yeah. But I see him sort of as this creature, a minotaur, a golem, or a bog monster. So the basement's sort of like, or is also a bog. So Anthony's favorite color is blue. Um, urinal cakes that there's <laughs> tremendous blue he she he you know as this creature in my head he only sees shades of blue within this bog or basement that i keep in and i'm using a lot of materials in relation to um you know the historic use of urinal cakes i'm using a lot of materials that are relating to orifices or things you expel upon or apply onto your orifices or consume 
Uh, the ticks, I feel like I'm part tick, especially because I came down with Lyme disease twice oh. within a year. And uh, Armorelli licorice, uh, it reverts back to my Italian American heritage and, uh, you know, cuisine and, you know, it's from Calabria. And um, I just think it's a really tight pairing. Um, there's a correlation there that I think uh, makes a lot of sense. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can go into all the vignettes and the meaning and this paired with this and weaving and it becomes, you know, this work. I really feel like the work becomes its own entity, you know? So I can explain what drove it, but it's not, for me, it's not, nece it's not necessary, you know? It really does stand alone as its own thing. And what I find interesting with Daniel's very personally driven imagery is that um, it seems to read beyond like the personal, it, it reads sort of universal. So like for instance, when I came across the, the, the urinal cakes, I just thought like, it's bizarre, but it's like, this is uh, a thing that really was sort of invented in the 20th century, very specifically like a chemical that we, we all encounter, but it, it's made sense to me like, it made sense that he would use orange tang, which I think is also a concoction that was created for astronauts to travel within space, right? Like they needed food. Oh, it's um, totally and, American. It's totally American. So like, and then when I heard about the ticks, I thought like, it's, it's like, yeah, he's gotten Lyme disease twice, but then I just had read this article about how ticks, there's a uh, maybe conspiracy theory, but there's a conspiracy theory out there, a theory that the American government had weaponized ticks as a kind of biological weapon and that Lyme disease is actually like the impact of that. And I was, yeah, so, <laughs> exactly. So the interpretations are like very like, he could, he could go into the personal and like, it would make really as much sense as someone who cares to delve into that. I'm very interested in how the imagery feels in the macro sense, which is like almost kind of the opposite. Yeah, I think but like nobody needs to buy like my kind of weird, strange way of interpreting the information either, right? I think so, my micro, uh, you know, inspiration within Newburgh in my life and my family there, it does uh, lend itself to the macro because it's, yeah. it's a portion of the whole. Yeah. So I felt like it was the right time to do a show because we had finally gotten to this sort of like general agreement where like, I don't know if I will understand everything about his personal history. <laughs> it might take me like a whole lifetime to, to do that because I'm sure that there's new stories happening every day. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he'll necessarily agree with my approach of like curating. Um, and so might as well just jump at the chance to like, you know, kind of tie it up in a bow and do an exhibition now because we had gotten to this point where we were at least willing to like meet ourselves halfway in this like micro macro kind of way of like talking about the show. Um, where we sort of understand that the other aspect is at play as well as the one aspect that we both champion in this particular kind of case. So, yeah. Why the, so when we were talking about the show, we, we talked about the masks, but then the pipes came about, which were a surprise. The pipes were a surprise to me. All right, so the pipes originated from a friend expressing to me that he would like to own a pipe. And then I thought, oh, I should make him a gift Hi. So I got, I procured this block of black locust, which is impervious. Right. And, which is uh, the wood. Yeah. Not like locusts. Right. Like from Exodus. Yeah. <laughs> and plagues. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> specifically wood here. Yes. But um, I started car. I started making these pipes, and I'm thinking, fuck, gifting it to my friend. I got to make this into something so I can show it. Yeah. And then. So they just came about and they came really fast and it just made sense. I thought they were a really nice pairing with the masks for yeah. the show. Um, Did your friend eventually get a pipe? No. Oh no. And he told me he stopped smoking. So. Oh, okay. But then through making the pipes, I was thinking, oh my God, all the pictures I saw of my grandfather, he always had a pipe in his mouth, <laughs> you know? So there's, and then it goes back to the family and you know, one of them's called Frank, my grandfather, uh, Frank Giordano. And, um, you know, and I, I don't, I've never smoked anything in my life. And I think it's sort of preposterous and absurd that I'm making these, yeah. these pipes. And, uh, yeah, it's fun. I was working in a new material that I haven't used before. And 
doing traditional carving. Yeah. So, uh, and then I had this Murano glass and it made sense to use it as sort of like the, uh, the smoke coming out of the pipe. And I think how you wrote it, where there was a restraint, I do feel like there, there is a restraint in terms of material and, um, you know, the preciseness. Yes. So, yeah. and I'm pleased with how they came out. Yeah, me too. That would be great. I have a strange relationship to them. I feel like pissing in urinals because I feel like there's always going to be that mist. Yes, coming up. Oh, yeah. yeah, coming back onto you. Yeah, from your we your pee, you know. <laughs> and then you have to angle it a certain way so it slides in. So I just go oh to the God. toilet. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I just prefer fucking sitting on the toilet. Fuck it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just my particularities. Yeah. I. Uh, you know, a friend pointed out to me, he's like, Daniel, you know, your work is really revolving around this. It's not exclusive to that, but there's a lot of material, you know, the food, lipstick, urinal cakes, uh, baby rash ointment, um, you know, lotion. I'm using a lot of uh, tanning, tanning spray to pigment things. Also, all of these masks, the bases of them are moisturizing face masks that yeah. are store-bought that he's used himself. Yeah. I don't know, I, I feel like in Vancouver, there's actually like links to other works, um, like Liz Magor's like Mouthful series, where like, like the kind of obsessing around orifices and like, cons and, and like eating and stuff is like a consumptive thing. Like it's almost like, it's like you need like nourishment, but then like people, um, like I'm, eating a bonbon right now. I don't need this bonbon to survive. You know, it's like, I don't need a piece of candy to survive today, but I do it because it's like a, a thing that, you, that people do, they consume, right? So it's like consumptive behaviors vary from person to person, but it exists and it actually drives like everything. Like, you know, if you want to think about resource extraction and, and globalization, macro micro economies and its impacts on the environment, like you start with that personal consumptive behavior and it could be like a straight board is eating like a Dorito. Sure. You know? Yeah, I so. mean, and I'm trying to preserve things like family, you know, literally my Aunt Vicky's cheesecake, you know, blended with resin or uh, I see resin as sort of my ambrosia, you know, it's the key to immortality for some of these uh, things that could expire. Are you ever concerned that like the stuff under the resin would disintegrate over time and how it's going to change No, because I'm usually blending it. Oh, okay. So it's thoroughly being blended or like with the deep fry we were talking about, it it, um, it penetrates. Right. You know, or so absorbs. So it fills in. But do you think the, ch the color would change over time? There may be a possibility, but um, I'm more concerned with it just having the longevity of not, you know, deteriorating right. past color. But I haven't really noticed in terms of color. Mm. Uh, in a recent show, Daniel deep fried a motorcycle, um, which feels very iconoclastic. Like I was sort of like, wow, like, it wasn't a Harley, but might as well have been, right? <laughs> like any motorcycle will do. Like it's very easy riding a motorcycle. Yeah. Like, he chose, but also deep frying is very American. It's like, I mean, it's, it's strange that it's so American. So I was thinking about this because you go to like, Europe and you have like mussels and fries it's also deep fried but like you don't think of it as like oh it's just like a way to cook you think deep fried you think like fast food you think yeah like America it's like this yeah. specific consumptive thing that's sort of like the people do it's like people lead lives lives of conveniences I do like I'm as guilty as everybody else it's horrible um I consume probably way too much of it you know like for my own good um, and it's, it's like, it, it's part of like the 21st century condition that needs to be really mediated to like stray away from what we've all been programmed to do, you know? So it's, it's a really kind of interesting sculpture. It made me think about all these things when like, when I saw it. And I think like the, the more interesting of Daniel's sculptures kind of lead you down these like random paths, you know, like where it makes you like kind of feel like you want to assess your life or something. Or think about like, <laughs> like culture in general and how the world is going. <laughs> cool. You know, it's good. Yeah. Like whether you come up with any conclusions, it's entirely up to you. You could just have these random thoughts and choose to reject them all. 
Yeah. Or not. <laughs> so. I'm glad it, yeah, as long as it's posing questions, it's good. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, the deep fry initially, that came from, you know, deep frying zucchini flowers with my grandmother, you know, and then it just branched out from there. And Billy, uh, from Ren and Stimpy, uh. there's this character called Billy the Beef Tallow Boy, and he <laughs> came off of a box <laughs> in this in one of the episodes. Really? He came out of a girl. box? Yeah, he came off, he was, he was like the decor on a box. He oh, was the that. advertising. And he went to play with this little girl whose father wouldn't play with her, so he came off the box to play oh. with her. And he started deep frying a telephone and he's deep frying <laughs> shoes. And the father's hungry and he starts eating it. And they're like, hey, hey, Billy, can he deep fry the Buick? And uh, he deep fries the fucking Buick. <laughs> and, the, and the dad eats it, you know? Wow. Uh, so Billy the Beef Tallow Boy taught me that I could deep fry anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know? How do you deep fry a motorcycle? Do you have to deep fry it part by part? Uh, I'm just, I'm spreading the egg and breadcrumb, and then I'm, uh, I'm ladling on boiling oil. I have it on an incline. Oh, I see. And then I have a big trough at the bottom collecting it all. Ugh. So I'm just That's ladling nasty. it on and using, and doing a torch for extra <laughs> until I can get the fucking wow. jumbo deep fryer. I was thinking of using a dumpster. Okay. But yeah. How many days before all that oil stops moisturizing your skin? Like uh, it would just get on you, right? It's horrible. Yeah, I use a hazmat suit. Yeah. You're worried yeah. about a urinal puck? <laughs> like, it seems worse. <laughs> oh, a hazmat suit. Okay, fine. <laughs> Go home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lobby.